series on Americans for some time. I just want to let you know that we're right about at the halfway point of the miracles of Jesus. We've looked at God's miracles over creation. We've looked at God's miracles uh, over the demonic. And now we're into the time of, of physical healing. How many of you have ever had the need to be healed? Raise your hand. Uh, that's one thing all of us have in common. Sick, ill, pain. I had a conversation with someone yesterday who had had a, a long shift and their knees and their feet were aching. Anybody relate to that? Um, we've got a lot of problems with our bodies. Now, I want to, if you haven't been here for the whole time, it's summer, people are going all over the place. I'd like to give you just a little bit of a, a snapshot of big picture miracles of Jesus. The description in the scriptures doesn't use the word miracle. We use the word miracle. The description in the scriptures is sign and wonders. Signs and wonders. Now, signs say something. They point to something. And they are of our benefit because we can read them today as well as the people reading them back then. So miracles aren't just to put us in a state of awe and go, wow. Just to get our jaws to drop open at the power of this individual. They also speak something to us as they did back then. It's very important that all of us know that all the miracles of Jesus, except the cursing of the fig tree, were positive and redemptive. Now, if you don't know what the word redemptive means, when you redeem something, you're buying it. You're, you're covering the debt. Now, the debt that we have is sin. Jesus came to cover the debts. Now, you might ask, if all the miracles are redemptive, then how are the miracles over creation redemptive? The multiplication of the wine, the multitude of the fishes, the multiplying of the bread, the calming of the sea. Now, how can those things be redemptive? Now, you have to remember, all the way back to the beginning, let's see, you're this way, all the way back to the beginning, Genesis, when we sinned, it brought a curse on us, illness and death. It brought a curse on creation itself because creation was created for us. So when we sinned, all of creation followed us down that trail. Have you ever done something in sin and it affected someone else? You do something and somebody else pays the price for it? There's no such thing as private sin. Sin affects everything. So creation was fallen. So one of the things that was said to Adam is that by his toil on his brow would he bring fruit from the ground. So one of the things that happened when sin entered the world is we had to work for stuff. There's no deserts. You don't go out into the desert and just pick up food. You have to toil for it. We have to work. It's called labor. Before the fall, that didn't exist. They walked in the garden. They were hungry. They took what they wanted. And they just ate it. There wasn't work. So when Jesus was in the desert place where there was no food and there was an abundance, it was a redemption of creation so that everybody had everything they needed without want. There is no hunger. There is no sickness. There is no storm of life that will threaten your life when you're on a boat. Creation itself is in rebellion. When we read in the Psalms that creation longs for his appearing, the earth had, is expressing a desire to be healed as well. So all of God's miracles are redemptive. They bring wholeness. They cover. They restore. So we see the restoration of creation when he comes. We see, the, we see the defeat of the demonic power when he casts them out because he comes to destroy that power. And now we're into the physical. Every time we get sick, it's an indication of death that is coming. And any time we are healed from something physical, we know that that is only temporary because all of us have an appointment with death. If you don't think about that very often, then it's good to think about it at least from time to time. 
There's not a single one of us, unless Jesus come today or prior to our death, that, that we're not going to die. Why? Because God promised us that. It's the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. Jesus came to give us a gift of life and to restore and give abundance. Now today, we're going to look at several different miracles of Jesus. We're going to clump them up a little bit. Next week, we're going to look at when he healed lepers because there's a powerful sign in that. And after that, we're going to look at how he healed people who were blind because there's a sign in that as well. Today, we're going to highlight the power of intercessors. So here's the question. Who are you interceding for? A, a person that intercedes is a person that, that steps in on the behalf of someone else that cannot. It's someone that goes in a place where someone else can't go. Now this morning's miracles the first one is the healing of the paralytic. And I would have you look at your text to Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. This was probably one of the most famous miracles that Jesus did. It's one that many of us learned in Sunday school class when we were small, like the kids will be learning Bible stories today. The healing of the paralytic. So you've got a guy who literally cannot walk. How's he going to get to Jesus? Lest he be carried. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, so many gathered, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So men came, bringing him, bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now pause there just for a second. Why did these people bring the paralytic Jesus. Anyone? To heal his paralysis. What did Jesus do? He forgave his sins. Which is the greater miracle? Friends. Now, some of you know my testimony. Some of you know that my kid was healed when I was 18. And I hear a lot of people say this to me. I've never had anything like that before. And they kind of speak a little bit with envy because they pray for things that they haven't happened. Well, let me tell you. If the Holy Spirit has moved in your heart and the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven your sins and you have a relationship with Him, you have, you have received a far greater miracle because my, this body is going to go in the grave with the hip that was healed when I was 18. Amen? You've experienced the greater miracle. Let's not forget that every physical healing that we might experience is only temporary. It's only for a while. That's why, that's why some of these like faith healing ministries that try to measure people's faith all the time and say, well, if you didn't experience it, it's not because it's because your faith is weak. We're going to address that question today, by the way. How come they don't live longer? Those, those powerful faith healing pastors that knock people onto their but, shouldn't they live to 120? They've got so much faith. We're talking temporary. Now Jesus, in this case, forgives sins, and then he does the miracle. Unlike some other texts where he, he healed them and then forgave their sins. So he did it this way for a reason. So, let's find out why. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now they would be right if Jesus wasn't God. Now sometimes people get into this practice of feeling like they receive their sins being forgiven by a person. No one can forgive a sin except that person 
who the sin is committed against. David in Psalm 32 identifies that he sins only before God. Now when we do, when we sin, we sin against other people, but we have to recognize that anytime we sin against someone else, sin against creation, sin in our mind, all of that is an offense against God. Only God can forgive that. Now the people that are the teachers of the law understand this, but where they fail to understand is that he is declaring himself God who has the power to forgive our sins. Do you believe it? Now sometimes we play little head games with the devil on this one. Friends, if Jesus forgives you for your sins, don't you think that that's a temporary thing? Well, he forgave me this, but he's not going to forgive me of that. I've seen people afraid to come back to church because the devil gets in their head and says, well, you can't go back there because you sinned. You did this horrible thing. You think God is going to accept you? God's word says yes. Can I hear an amen to that? Don't let the devil get in and remove the gift of God that he's given you. <laughs> when your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, period. Now, we might need to feel that afresh, but when the, the Word of God says if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Any of you ever feel that worthy? live before God. Anyone ever feel that worthy? Usually when sin is fresh, we don't feel worthy. We feel shame. And we feel guilt. Now there's two kinds of guilt and shame. One will put us to our knees where we ask God to redeem us, refresh us, and He restores us and puts us back in action. There's another kind of guilt and shame where the devil will give you false guilt, false shame for something that you did that Jesus has paid for. He's reconciled the books. You're good with God between you and God, but you have the belief that you're not. And as a result, you're taken out of action. You're no longer effective in serving God and being obedient to God because the devil's in your head telling you lies and you're believing them. So, if anybody's good at getting into our hats, let it be Jesus. Amen? So in this text, now there's teachers of the law sitting there thinking to themselves, okay, they're not talking out loud. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. So immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And don't make a mistake on this. God knows exactly what you're thinking in your hearts. So if right now you happen to be in one of those moments in a sermon where you're kind of wrapped trailing off to something else, bring it back because God knows exactly what you're thinking. Hear this, people. God knows what you're thinking. And when he knows what you're thinking, he addresses it by the power of his spirit. That's exactly what he does here. Why are you thinking these things? When your mind gets wrong, listen to Jesus ask this question. Why are you thinking these things? Then he says, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth for, for, to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and walked out in full view of all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything. He's declaring himself as the Son of Man, which was an identifying marker of a prophet of God. Note specifically the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Son of Man means that you have human parents, but he identifies it in such a way that this Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, which means this Son of Man is also God. Now, this is the truth. You must acknowledge that he is God so that you can receive this forgiveness of sins. So let's answer this question. What really is harder? Saying the words, your sins are forgiven, 
or saying, take up your mat and come on. What would be more difficult for me? Your sins are forgiven. Or, everyone who has a physical ailment in this place be healed. What would be harder? The, the second is harder. Because the first cannot be seen. The first is invisible. The first cannot be proven. A person that says, your sins are forgiven, you can't prove that they're wrong. You can't prove that they're right. So what he does, he, he does a flip-flop on this one. It's, it's more difficult to actually do the forgiving of sins. So he flips these two things back and forth and he sends them away in a, in a mental realm. Got to do that with you? Reveal something to you that kind of gets your head spinning and you walk away and it kind of sticks in your mind for days. As you try to write yourself. Reminds me of the time I was pulling somebody on a, on a tube behind my boat. And he got really fancy. Tried to stand up on the thing and went down and hit his eardrum on the surface of the water. And when that happens, you lose your equilibrium and he was, you know, he needed somebody to come alongside and straighten him out a little bit. And who doesn't need that? To get a little someone come alongside and help a bit. I want to I get to these guys here. This man would not have been at the feet of Jesus unless they brought him. So in the midst of this, this teaching, was Jesus so full of himself that now? Who, who would interrupt me preaching? This is Jesus. Jesus never gets upset when sinners come to Jesus. Never. Okay. He, he got a little obstinate when people opposed him, but when people need him and come to him humbly, he never sends them away. Ever. He always receives them and gives them more than what they ask for. Now, in this case, we've got some intercessors, a team of them. Sometimes it takes more than one to intercede on behalf of another, to get things done, to help bless and serve other people, to bring them in the presence of Jesus. And when you're organized, you can do that. We have that from intercessory prayer as well. I know... Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a couple of wonderful blessings. Joe and Eileen's granddaughter, Andrea, who has been blessed with healing. Uh, Vern's hand that we prayed for, and it, the pain was, was gone. Many times we see that from interceding, other people coming together and praying, like we did for Debbie's sister a number of weeks ago, praying that she would come to know the Lord and she came. One of the things that blessed me about that was Debbie was also praying for some physical healing for herself, but we received a greater miracle. Amen. So who are you bringing to Jesus? And the thing that he commends in this case is the, their faith. They had faith that would overcome obstacles. You know, there are some people that, that they get moved, you know, they're, they're going to do something, they're, they're going to go to church, they, they go and they stand in the back and they go, ah, uh, only the front row is left. <laughs> and they kind of stand back there and they kind of pace and they, they look and it's like, ah. They, they won't overcome the, the perceived shame of walking in front of people. So they, they leave and they, when they leave, they miss the blessing of God. Drive and they see the parking lot kind of full. They look at their watch and they're a couple minutes late. They go, ah, let's just do something else today. Right? If our faith can't overcome that obstacle, now these guys are climbing up on a roof. And back that, that day, they had ladders in the outside. It's not like they were rock climbers or something. The ladders in the outside. But it takes some coordination to get a paralyzed guy up. I don't know if they strapped him down or what, you know, recruited some help. But they overcame the obstacles. To bring people to Jesus, we need to overcome some obstacles. 
Sometimes those obstacles are in ourself. Sometimes those obstacles are external. But all of our faith has obstacles. And what Jesus commends here is a faith that will overcome obstacles. And just consider the result just for a moment. Imagine what it would be like to be paralyzed. Neck down paralysis. You can't do anything for yourself. You can't feed yourself. You can't bathe yourself. Someone has to help you with the dirtiest of duties in life. Nothing. And this man walked out of the place. And what about his eternal soul? Forever with Christ. Because people care. They care. Jesus says that if you don't love your brother, you don't love me. We need to care for other people. And when we see people that can't come to Jesus, we don't stand there and say, well, that's their responsibility. Sort of like the the old Field Green movie with a church mindset, if you build it, they will come. It's so like, well, we're here. We're here. Sometimes people have obstacles that keep them from coming. Maybe it's a, an experience in their past that needs to be talked through before they're open to come. Maybe, maybe it's just being a friendly person that will invite them and come alongside because they're afraid of coming into a new group. They don't know what, what happens oftentimes. So be an intercessor. Next miracle we're going to look at. We're going to look at the nobleman's son. And this is in John <coughs> chapter 4, verse 43. John 4, 43. Now, we've got a guy now that is coming because he's heard about Jesus. Some people are interested in God because they heard about what's going on there in the church. Sometimes people are attracted to your family because they, they, they have an interest, they have a desire. Maybe there's something that they need. And maybe they've tried other things, but they it's, it hasn't worked. They've experimented, but they're, they're searching for something. This guy comes, he doesn't have a lot of faith, but he hears about Jesus, and maybe, maybe Jesus can do something. This is his starting point. After the two days he left for Galilee, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So he's leaving a place where he wasn't doing a lot of miracles because people didn't believe. Okay? Then, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they had also been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Now, just, just a note here, the, the word miraculous here is not in the Greek. We do that to understand that he was like high, powerful signs and wonders is what he's saying. The word miracle, because of our common vernacular, we understand what he's saying. Unless you see miracles, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replies, You may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that that was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. 
So he and all his household believed. Wait a minute. So he and all of his household believed. Didn't it say that he took Jesus at his word? He came with faith that he's only going to be healed if he comes to my house. Jesus said, go, he's, he's back. He took him at his word and he started on his way. Then when the servants met him and said that he's better, the first thing he did is inquire at what time. Why? Because he wanted to know when it happened. When he found out when it happened, his faith grew like this. Oftentimes, God does miracles not because of our faith, but to grow it. You might have faith this much, and then God does something really incredible that you witness and your faith goes up. How many have experienced this before? God does miracles to grow our faith as well. Not only that, but he believed so much that he influenced the entire household, and they believed too. Because they saw how sick he was, and they saw him restored. A little interesting thing about my testimony of the healing of my hip. Now, that was in response to watching the Seven Hundred Club. I was 18. Pat Robertson, Ben uh, Kershaw, Crenshaw, and uh, Galleon Tenuta was on, on the show at the time. It was a long time ago. I don't remember all the details. But I remember this. I was, I was praying afresh. Forgot to heal my hip. I had the disease from the time I was five. I prayed the same prayer that I prayed probably a thousand times or more. Dear Lord, if your will please me kill my hip in Jesus' name, I pray amen. That was the prayer I prayed every night. And several times in the day. I believe that God could heal me. I prayed it again, and then uh, the, the gal on the 700 Club said she just received a word of knowledge that someone's being healed. She gave my nickname and all that, and then I, how many of you have ever gone on your face before the Lord? I literally went on my face before the Lord and praised Him for healing my death. I didn't stand and test it. My first response was on the ground. I felt God's power hand go right through my body. Later I inquired, because, you know, when those things happen, you call in and you tell them what happened and different things like that. I inquired and discovered that that this was a rerun. That this was taped earlier. Jesus spoke word of knowledge to her that he was healing me before I prayed for it. And my faith went. You ever pray for something? Post dated because you told somebody you'd pray for them and then you forgot and the thing is over? Sometimes I post date prayers. <laughs> because an event happens, God, you're bigger than this. I know that you're above time and all that. And I know that he's above time because I've witnessed it. And my faith grew. I believe that I believe in miracles, but I didn't. I was very skeptical about words of knowledge that God would actually speak through somebody. That was a pretty odd job my draw. Dropped my jaw. As this man. And his faith increased because the power of God was displayed in a loved one's life. Saved his son. How would you respond if your child was on deathbed and got saved? Would that increase your faith? It did with him. So this, I want to look at the starting point here. The starting point here is a man with very, very little faith. He just heard about Jesus and he's coming because of his fame. And it believes he's famous. He believes there's some power there, otherwise he would come. But he would have to be there in person, for sure. Have to, you know, touch him and stuff. And in the end, his faith grows. Now we're going to look at the contrast of this. By looking at the, the healing of the centurion's servant, we're going to go to Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Now here... Is, is a story where Jesus encounters someone that <coughs> frankly doesn't walk up to Jesus every day. Anyone know any doubters when it comes to God? I mean, they are just filled with doubts. The people that claim that God is there. I believe in God, but to believe in Jesus, I mean, that's a stretch. 
constantly arguing back and forth. They have no faith at all. It's very frustrating. Can you imagine how frustrated Jesus was? Even as his disciples not having faith. They had no clue what he was talking about, even though he spoke about his resurrection over and over, his death over and over. They, they were clueless. They, they, they didn't get it. They had to keep repeating himself. And then out of the blue, Jesus is walking along, and here comes this guy, recorded in Luke chapter 7. When Jesus had finished saying all these, all this in the hearing of the people, he, had, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. Now, this is a guy who would, would be categorized as a, a Gentile, God-fearing person. This is a person that has been exposed to Judaism. He knows the Old Testament. And he is such a faithful follower of God that he bankrolled the building of the synagogue in his town. He's highly respected among the Jews. Do you read very much of Gentiles that are highly respected among the Jews? No. So this guy is well known by everybody. The elders went to Jesus. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself, a man under authority with soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turned to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant. In this case, faith preceded the miracle. You hear pastors or teachers try to give you some formula for healing. You've got to do this, 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 this. No, Jesus is bigger than any formula. There are people that he will heal based on the intercession of your prayers and your prayers alone, even though they don't have faith at all. What do we know about this man's service? Does, did he have faith? We don't know. What about the nobleman's son? Did, did the nobleman's son have faith? We don't know. We know that the household had faith afterwards, but not before. God does not fit into our like formulas of the way that we try to prescribe things oftentimes. God will go before you. God will go behind you. He is above you and underneath you. His ways are higher than man's ways. His thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. The one common denominator in these three miracles are that in all three of these miracles, the people that were healed were dependent on someone else's faith, whether it be great or small. So I'm going to close with this. Our God has got miraculous signs and wonders. And He speaks to us. And as He speaks to us, we understand the ways of God. And as I as I noted last week, 50% of the healings, 50% recorded in the Gospels, are from a person interceding on behalf of another. Are you interceding? All of us know, know what it's like to have others intercede on our behalf. Where would you be today without the prayers of someone else? Some of you have faithful grandparents, faithful parents, faithful friends. Somebody that came to you, confronted you with the truth of the gospel, and by their care and love for you, brought you to Jesus. 
Who knows what the thousands of prayers that have been said for you that you're here today. That you are who you are because of other people here. And this care is not just like giving to the United Way care. This care is care for your well-being between you and God. They want to bring you to Jesus so that you can know him and experience the fullness of life that he, he came to give. So, knowing that Jesus knows your thoughts, who are you intercessing for? Who are you going before the throne of heaven with repetition and faith for? I know a lot of you. I know some of you who are interceding for your children because your children are not where they need to be. You want them in the fold. Some of you are interceding for siblings because of difficulties that they're going through. Some of you are interceding for parents that don't know Christ, even though they're aging. And I want to encourage you in that. Encourage you in that. Because this is what faithful people do. We intercede for others that they might know the wonder of Jesus. Please pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that encourages us to serve you. And Lord, some of us were maybe dragged and carried to you one day, and we left under new strength and power because we met you. God, help us not to forget what you've done for us. Help us not to forget the healing that we've received. We pray that that would be fuel in our soul to bring others to you too. God, we pray that in this coming week, that over and over again you would call people to mind. That as we interact with people and we, we see them, that our, our thoughts would go beyond flesh and blood to have concern and care and love for people that might not even be likable that you have put in our path so that we could lead them to you. We pray that you would give us faith for this. We pray that you would work with us where we are. For Lord, we are of little faith before you. Grow us, strengthen us, so that we might have the faith of this, this Gentile. That we would know your power. Your authority over the demonic realm, your authority over illness, your authority over creation, that we would call upon you personally and lay our request before your throne in heaven. And we give you thanks that you receive our prayers and answer them according to.